this video will list all the Category B anime TV series I'm aware of. I've watched all of these TV shows and written reviews on them, which I've posted on IMDb. In this video, I will condense this into an easy-to-watch format with the aim of assisting players in finding good anime to watch. Most experienced anime viewers will have almost certainly seen most of these shows, but I'm hoping there may be something in this list which may prove useful. Before proceeding with providing a list of the anime, I wish to make an explanation of my category system. After trying a variety of numeric systems to determine how good a show is or not, in the end I found it too hard to compare different shows which may have been watched at different times. As a result, I now ask myself two questions. Did I enjoy it the first time I watched it? And can I watch it again and still enjoy it? If the answer is yes for both, then it's a category A. If the answer is yes for the first, but no for the second, then it's category B. In order to determine factors which influence the classification of shows, we need to start with the core story arc. Ideally, this needs to be simple. So Gone with the Wind, which is basically a story about a woman who wants a man, fails to get him, and then another man who wants the same woman, who succeeds, then they break up, and the woman realises that she actually wanted the second guy after all. It's hard to stuff up a core story arc when it's reasonably simple, but this definitely occurs. And the main reason why this occurs is the story arc is too complex and something which tends to get ignored, it's simply implausible. An impossibly convoluted and complex story arc will detract from any story. So in Star Trek Picard, the story arc seems to be Picard goes on a long and convoluted and seemingly random search for some truth. He discovers a massive threat to the whole inhabited galaxy and instead of trying to stop it, he wants to save the androids which want to initiate it. It just makes no sense at all. Because the story arc is convoluted and confusing and random, we are uncertain what the whole point of the story is. And when we have no idea what the point is, we basically have no interest in the story. The second is implausibility. If it's implausible, it will detract from the story. In, this, in the case of Gone with the Wind, the various love interests are all plausible. Scarlet wants Ashley because she can't have him. Arette wants Scarlet because she, he sees a wild spirit in Scarlet which matches his own. They split because Rhett still thinks Scarlet still wants Ashley, while Scarlet decides she actually wanted Rhett because Ashley was simply always out of reach and really not what she wanted. It's all actually plausible. In Star Trek Picard, the story arc is so implausible as to verge on the ludicrous. Thus, there's no possibility of anyone having any interest in it because it just makes no sense and is highly implausible. Why is story arc important? Well, the purpose of the story arc is to give the audience a reason to watch the next episode. When a story arc is complex, we lose interest in it, and that reduces our interest in watching the next episode. If the story arc is implausible, the same occurs. There is one more tra other trap. If the story arc is totally predictable, then we can quickly lose interest as well. It should be noted that the story may use other methods to keep our interest, so this is not an automatic fail, but it's difficult to get over this hurdle. Thus, we are looking for a simple and plausible story arc, which has enough mystery in it to make the audience want to know how this will end. In Gone with the Wind, we want to know who ends up with whomever. I must admit, in Star Trek, Trek Picard, the story arc is also pre not predictable, so we may wish to know what happens. However, it's so confusing, implausible and random, basically it really doesn't even matter because anything could be the uh, the result and that's exactly what occurs with Star Trek Picard if you actually get to the end. Another pull is characters. If the characters are relatable, likeable or interesting that can sometimes overcome a story arc issue and if the story arc is good those three features relating to a character really makes this a very watchable series. The simplest character is someone we can relate to. So in Overlord, Ainz could be any of the audience and we could wonder what we would have done in his situation. The next aspect is likability. So in the saga of Tanya the Evil, Victoria is nice and a likable character. We begin to care for her and do not wish her any harm. On the other hand, once we see that sweet Victoria is able to cut the throat of an enemy soldier, we are less concerned about her but then she becomes an interesting character. Finally, if we cannot relate or like a character, 
the character must be interesting. So the character of Tanya, while not likable or relatable, is very interesting. A super logical mind in a battle of wits against God is a character we want to know more about. If we take this analogy to A Gone with the Wind, Scarlet is interesting and Rhett is likable. In Star Trek Picard, no characters are like, relatable in, as they act in a manner which defies any form of normal logic. No long-term characters are likable, although Elnor is the closest to a likable character. No character is truly interesting. While all the characters seem to act illogically in a strange manner, none of this is interesting. Instead, it's simply implausible. It's impossible to consider a true psychopath as interesting, no matter how clever he or she is, because the basic motivations of such a character are unfathomable, and thus they become a little more than random acts. The next factor we need to consider is character arc. That is, what is the character development? If the character does not develop, or develops in an implausible manner, then the audience may have little interest in the character's story arc, which detracts from the character. Now, if the character is likable enough and relatable enough, etc., you could probably get over this, but it's a big hurdle to overcome. People, when they attach to a character, they want to see some sort of development. Once again, this does not obviously kill the character if you don't have development, but it does make it harder for us to be interested in the character. So in Star Trek Picard, Picard does, does not seem to experience any character development, although at least it's somewhat constant consistent. Seven of Nine's character is so unpredictable it's difficult to displace much interest in her. She seems to randomly murder anyone she does not like and the only development is she promises not to murder anyone again unless required. Another factor we need to consider with characters is consistency. If a character lacks consistency then any positivity it may gain from other factors can be completely wasted. If we look at a specific character which should be positive in Star Trek Picard, which is Picard, we end up with someone who seems to lack any drive at all. Picard is constantly being pushed around and insulted. Now, this is not a formula of success and certainly not a formula which allows us to relate to it. And what's even worse is this lacks any consistency to the Picard in the next generation. That Picard is both interesting and likable, if not relatable. The current Picard in the current series lacks any of these characteristics, so we're dealing with a completely different person. On the other hand, Seven of Nine, if we look at um, you know Drive, has plenty of it, but it tends to manifest itself in, in the form of murdering people in an almost uncontrollable manner. Seven of Nine should be an interesting character, if not likable or relatable, but her random acts of violence and lack of consistency wastes this positive attribute. Compare this 7 to 9 with the 7 to 9 in the next generation, and you're dealing with someone that's completely different. So any, any positivity you may have got from the next generation or previous episodes is completely wasted because of a lack of consistency. What I call situation is also a factor. Situation could mean a specific mini-story arc, at the story background, or an interesting character interplay. In Overlord, a medium-length story arc the interaction with the lizard people is fascinating. We discover the lizard people, their problems, how they live and how they relate with each other. Then they are threatened and we see how they react and how they form new relationships due to this threat. Finally, we see their great conflict and eventual loss and redemption as the servants of Nazarick, while elements of this mini-story arc supports the core plot. The way it's done is so interesting and entertaining, it could even be a series by itself. In Star Trek Picard, most of the mini-story arcs lack much interest and seem to be more about toxic characters engaging in toxic behaviour. The search for Dr. Bruce Maddox is a good example, as not only was there no point to it, the actual location and fate of Maddox was anything but entertaining or interesting. If I actually cared for Maddox, perhaps there would be a redeeming feature of this mini-story arc, but the series never allowed me to care for him. We can also look at background or the, the palette which the story is painted upon. In Saga of Tanya the Evil, the situation of the alternate Germany in a war world where World War I never occurred and instead a new world war occurs is an interesting backdrop. We see an all too familiar world which is not quite that familiar and this alternate world holds our interest accordingly. In Star Trek Picard, the background, while very sci-fi in nature, contains nothing of any real interest or anything new. Any, there's nothing there to grab you. The only real difference from the classic or typical Star Trek sci-fi background is 
the descent of the Federation to evil, or at least a toxic dysfunctionality. Uh, this is not a success story. There was almost no effort on focusing on the sci-fi nature of this background, and it was simply a typical background of, you know, that was used in a mindless ma- manner. And instead, we ended up with deception, disrupting, irrational behaviour painted upon this vanilla background. Uh, and quite frankly, this could have just as easily been done in a uh, contemporary TV soap. There was nothing there unique that would keep someone's attention or incentivize someone to look at the next episode. Another factor is a character interplay, which can really be a big plus. In Overlord, when Irons, or Momon, goes on a quest with the Swords of Darkness, the character imp- interplay is both interesting and enlightening. Watching and listening to the way this group worked and interacted with Momon, and the w- then the way Momon reacted when he found them dead was riveting viewing. I really wanted to know what was going to happen, how they were going to react, and what information was being disclosed. On the other hand, in Star Trek Picard, the relationship between Picard and his so-called crew is anything but interesting. It becomes a painful watch and detracts from the story. I just wanted the plot to progress rather than have to endure more arguments, insults and barely controlled pointless violence. So in conclusion, what we're looking for, or what makes a Category A or Category B TV series, is a simple and plausible story arc which has enough mystery in it to make the audience want to know how this will end. Characters which are interesting, likeable or relatable. Interesting situations, either mini story arcs, backgrounds or character interplay. The reason why these factors are critical is all of them make us want to keep on watching. We want to know what happens to our characters and we want that experience to be as entertaining, as riveting as possible. And when we have this, we have a Category A or a Category B TV series. When Ghost in the Shell came out, there was a number of other badass female characters, Angel Cop Cop being one. I must admit preferring the manga for this series. But even so, this is a surprisingly good story arc and has good character arcs. Its downside is the animation, which was, you know, stated the art will comment in 1989, so not a real negative back then, but uh, for today, people would really, it, you, people would really great. But nonetheless, I consider this actually quite a good anime. What is most entertaining in Eon Flux is its sheer bizarreness. The audience attention is instantly captivated as the viewer desperately attempts to understand what is occurring. The action is rapid and the depth is astounding, although a lot of the depth is pseudo-depth, which can also be great as it allows the viewers to paint whatever they wish to place in that pseudo-depth. There is also reasonable, it's also reasonably rewatchable, although its attractiveness drops on the second viewing. Finally, it's so filled with dark twists, it will keep your brain working well after you turn off the TV. It's certainly well worth a first viewing, and even on a second viewing, some of the episodes are quite watchable. There were three real badass female characters in this period, um, you know, Kusanagi being one, and Angel Cop the, being the other, and Armitage three was the third. The execution of the anime leaves much to be desired, the sto- but the story arc is good. The character development is good, and the mystery and conclusion is very interesting. For 1995, I consider the artwork subpar, and if you compare this with Ghost in the Shell movie, you'll see what I mean. On the other hand, the amount of money in the industry was a lot less, so I suppose it was excusable. This is actually a good story. The only thing that made great is the quality of the animation, and there's a little bit of uh, translation issue and stilted sort of um, flow of the plot. But otherwise, good series, well worth watching. For many viewers, this was their introduction to anime, although for myself, I was watching Lane when this came out. I loved this series at first, uh, my first viewing, but I must admit I find it hard to watch again. Knowing the end or ends eliminates a major factor pulling you through the episodes. The main character's endless whining does does get annoying on the second viewing, but if you have not watched this before, you need to watch it. It is a classic. Cowboy Bebop Remix is another classic, and my first exposure was the movie, which I think was great. Based on this, I purchased the TV series and was not disappointed. Most of the stories are standalone, while some are a bit slow, some are brilliant. The characters are great. Strangely enough, I found the standalone episodes far superior than the, the general loosely structured theme that runs through. But nonetheless, this is a very good anime, and quite often people say that 
if you want to introduce someone to an anime that's not familiar with animes, this is probably the series that you would use. Roughnecks, the Starship a Troopers, a Chronicles may not belong here as it's not really technically an anime, uh, although it does use CGI and a lot of more contemporary animes also use CGI, so probably uh, it may actually fit into this grouping. This is the CGI version of Starship Troopers, and it is surprisingly good. I think the ending was cut short, but the journey, journey to get there was very enjoyable. The issue is it's very difficult to watch a second time, as it does move rather slowly in some parts. Well worth a watch. The Animatrix is a loose collection of related episodes, each of which is done in a different style and manner. While offering no consistent and coherent story arc, each episode is very entertaining. It's, of course, uh, designed to be part of the Matrix universe, and it does actually provide some you know, background information for the Matrix. It, this is definitely a beautiful series or movie or collection of episodes to watch. Spice and Wolf may actually end up being a Category A series because I think this is actually quite rewatchable. This is brilliant and is possibly the best character arcs I've ever seen, period. The relationship between the two main characters is captivating. While not much seems to occur, you will be captivated until the end. I developed such an interest in the character that the final set of episodes were very hard to watch because, of course, there was the tension element there. But the ending was very satisfying. God, I wish there was a sequel. This may even be, as I indicated before, Category A series. Make sure you watch this if you have a chance. The music is actually surprisingly good too. Darker Than Black was a series I purchased in my attempt to find something similar to Ghost in the Shell. While it's superficially similar, it's not really that similar, but is nonetheless very good. The core story arc does wander a lot, and I suspect this was not fleshed out when it first started. But the slowly uncovering mystery is a good hook to keep you watching, uh, until the uh, end of the series. The main character is very good and you quickly start to relate to him as well as the other team members. The only issue is on my second watching some of the episodes are difficult to get through. We enter another classic, Black Butler. My first exposure to this was the Japanese movie which I actually think is great and I think everyone should go out there and watch it if they possibly can. This encouraged me to try the anime and I was not disappointed. The early episodes are filled with mystery and a darkness which I found very interesting. The characters are great and Sebastian is the clear main focus of the series. I think the actual story arc is not that good, but the character arc, situation arcs and backstory more than makes up for it. Psycho Pass is about the closest to Ghost in Shell I could find, which required you to deal with serious moral conundrums. I found some of the episodes very disturbing, and while the main characters look childlike, the series deals with very disturbing adult topics and includes a significant amount of violence. There are more than one. There is more than one story arc. The core moral and the more basic find your enemy story arc. This is well work, worth a watch, and it'll really make you think. Real Life was an absolute surprise. I watched the first episode and I was so captivated I went ahead and watched the whole season. Otherwise, I would have never, ever considered watching this. This is a very strange story, a slice of life story, but with a rather strange twist. I found it fascinating and engaging, although it did give me a creepy feeling near the end. There is a good twist, twist at the end, which I should have seen coming, but which nonetheless surprised me. This is actually well worth watching. I was really surprised how much I liked Death March to the Parallel World Rhapsody. This could even find itself in a Category A because I did watch it a second time and I enjoyed it just as much. Every common trope you could imagine was used in this series and it all works rather well. There are some great moments, although I suspect it would be hard to create a sequel as the story arc is so basic you would be forced to construct constant repetition if you wanted to progress the story. This would result in it becoming boring, but for the first season, this is really well worth a watch and very enjoyable. I take back about the sequel. I really do like, would really like a sequel to be to come out with this. Black Butler: A Book of Circus is a follow-on mini movie of the Black Butler TV series. Now. I found this a little bit uh, mixed in terms of quality, with this one 
being the weakest in my mind. I do not think this belongs in my category B grouping, but the original TV series was so good that I will put it here at the present moment and try and see if I can rewatch it and redetermine if I like it a bit better, but I suspect it may drop to category C. Saying that, it's a reasonable story, but I found the characters less than interesting and parts were rather boring. If you like Black Butler, this should be watchable, but if you do not, then I would probably not watch it. I like the series, but I have to warn you, it's not easy getting through some of the episodes. This is not because of the dark story arc, but because the main character acts, acts like a total idiot sometimes. The advantage of this is you really see a major character arc, with the main character developing to a new character, which is probably hard to recognise at the end of the series, until, of course, he then continues to say something stupid right at the end. This is a good TV series, and I'm looking forward to the second season, but I would probably not watch the first season and you know until I've forgotten it, so it's not really something you could rewatch. This is a classic, and I suspect it will end up in my Category A anime list. The story is filled with mystery as we try and work out why these two girls are travelling through a devastated city in a German World War II half-track motorcycle. This will make you think and should captivate you to the end, which is both dark and uplifting. This is a great TV series. Many consider The Rising of the Sheet Hero a classic and probably would place it into a category A. But um, while I found it entertaining, it was not entertaining enough to watch a second time. The main character is simply too annoying, which is really its main drawback. Saying that, he does develop, so the character arc development is very good. Some of the arcs are implausible, which does detract from the overall tale. This was clearly an attempt to make characters do what the story required them, rather than organically, naturally progressing. It is absolutely well worth a first watch. I'm not quite sure if you could watch it again. This is another strange series, but some of the episodes are the most emotionally moving stories I've ever watched. About 60% of the episodes are so powerful you'll be almost brought to tears. But the same trope is repeated too many times and the ending is anything but satisfying. I also felt there was so much potential in Violet's backstory, which was never realised in the TV series. The main story arc is very poor, but the situation arcs are brilliant. The result of this is I have no interest in watching it again, although if a sequel came out, I would almost certainly watch it. There is a movie, which I'm absolutely look, looking forward to watch it, but I think I would have to be prepared to bring the tissues and suffer through a lot of emotional upheavals, because I can just imagine what it's going to be like. Great series to watch once. Not sure if you could watch it more than once. Uh, I am very surprised, didn't I say to make my abilities average in the next life, is in this list. As when I started this, I thought this would quickly become boring, but I was wrong. There were moments when this was almost occurring, but the anime always managed to avoid this boredom barrier that would make me stop watching it. The aspect which really made me like this was the end, as the first season looked like its sole purpose was to set up the actual story arc, and if a sequel came out, I would absolutely watch it. Once again, I find myself watching something that um, I would have never considered myself watching, but My li Next Life as a Villainous, All Routes Lead to Doom, is very entertaining, if a light story. I was very interested initially, and then after a few episodes th thought this was going to become a pure slice of life tale, but my expectations were subverted and we were plunged back into a crisis. This is very light, but is surprisingly enjoyable. Well worth a watch. Quick note about the IMDB ratings, which are provided for each anime covered. IMDB uses a simple 10-point ranking system, which is averaged out. Based on the placebo effect or prices law, no matter how good something is, at least 10% of the population will dislike it. This could be as high as 20%. Based on this, a rating of 9 out of 10 represents perfection, and 8 out of 10 represents very good. Most of the anime here have a ratings of between 7 and low 9. However... I find that the ratings of these animes are surprisingly low, considering how good I think they are. As a result, you'll always need to be careful when looking at any rating system, as it can easily lead you astray. The only thing you can be really certain is if the rating is below 5, it's probably not very good. Denken Sie daran, kampfen Sie immer für Heil Heimatun.